Chapter 2 Perhaps with a certain measure of irony, Socrates was viewed by the majority of Athenians as a chatterer, an idle talker. But this alleged idle talker obeyed and followed his god Apollo. He philosophized in the streets on the god's behalf and preached a kind of spiritual pederasty that leads the lovers, Aristes, of youths to the theocentric love of platonic truth and beauty. In this respect, Socrates is neither a typical representative of the Greek Enlightenment nor the intellectual leader of Athenian intellectuals, as influential Western scholars would claim until recently. Nor did he discourse, like most others, about the nature of the universe, investing what the experts call cosmos. Those men who did, he showed up as idiots, according to Xenophon. Initially acting as a typical idle talker, Socrates realises himself as a moralist. Strictly speaking, the man who is persuaded by nothing in him except the proposition, which appears to him the best when he reasons about it, is no metaphysician either. Though Apollo commanded him, as he supposed and assumed, to live philosophizing, examining himself and others, Socrates saw his own work in philosophizing, that is, in summoning all citizens, but especially wealthy youths of aristocratic origins, to perfect their soul as a sort of socio-political mission, following the gods' command and acting on the gods' behalf. Therefore his performance of thus understood dialectical work, Eragon, can be imagined as a form of piety and service, Latreia, to the god. Gregory Vlastos argues in his book Socratic Piety. Were it not for the divine command that first reached Socrates through the report Chaeropon brought back from Delphi, there is no reason to believe that he would have ever become a street philosopher. If what Socrates wants is partners in elentic, elenctic argument, why should he not keep in those at keep to those in whose company he had sought and found his eudaimonist theory, congenial and accomplished fellow seekers after moral truth. Why should he take to the streets, forcing himself on people who have neither taste nor talent for philosophy, trying to talk them into submitting to a therapy they do not think they need? There is no explanation other than a supposed divine command be it just literary topos or some inner experience, or Socrates' own wild presumption, keeping in mind that Socrates was no mystic in any conventional religious sense, but rather a zealous social worker and rationalising moralist serving his God for the benefit of his fellow Athenians. This madman's theatre is nevertheless regarded as a revolutionary project. Quoting Armstrong in the ancient and continuing pieties of the Greek world. And it is of the essence of his rationalist program in theology to assume that the entailment of virtue by wisdom binds gods no less than men. He could not have tolerated a double standard morality, one for men, another for the gods. Fully supernatural though they are, Socrates' gods could still strike his pious contemporaries as rationalist fabrications. Socrates undoubtedly regarded his own rationalism and his leap from epistemological ignorance to public, political and moral expertise as devised by the daemonion, the supernatural guide. His own front door was adorned, as A. H. Armstrong relates, by, quote, an unshaped stone called Apollo of the Ways and another stone called a herm, which at the head, which a head at the top and a phallus halfway down which Socrates would tend at the proper time like every other Athenian householder. In this respect he was quite traditional, although his presumably esoteric side, if this curious aspect of Socrates is not invented by Plato's dramatic imagination, is close to the madness of Orpheus, the divinely inspired mythical singer. In the context of traditional Hellenic culture, Orphism and Pythagoreanism may be viewed as a small sectarian movement. Alternatively, 
Orphism may be presented as a new spiritual program of radically revised anthropology, and of both cosmic and personal soteriology, partly derived from Egyptian and Anatolian sources. In either case, the Orphic doctrines sharply differ from those of early Hellenic, so-called Homeric and pre-Homeric spirituality. The main Orphic doctrine follows a pattern already established in the pyramid texts, asserting that the royal soul has its goal in unity with the divine through ascent and recollection. With considerable modifications, this anagogic scenario became an integral part of Platonism, whose adherents practiced rising up to the heights of philosophical contemplation through the anagogic power of Eros, and were able to reach the noetic sun by a combination of dialectical and telestic means. In short, Orphism maintains that the human soul is immortal and is subject to divine judgment. Quoting again from Armstrong, The divine in us is an actual being, a daemon or spirit, which has fallen as a result of some primeval sin and is entrapped in a series of earthly bodies, which may be animal and plant as well as human. It can escape from the sorrowful, weary wheel the cycle of reincarnation, by following the Orphic way of life, which involved, besides rituals and incantations, an absolute prohibition of eating flesh. The somewhat clumsy Socrates hardly fits the much demanding Orphic ideals, although he nevertheless functions in Plato's symposium as an Orpheus figure, being presented as a literary double of Farnes. The self-manifested Farnes of the Orphic cosmogonies should be described as protogonos, the firstborn, tantamount to the noetic light which appears from the egg of ineffable darkness, whose other name is the demiurgic Eros. He carries within himself the seed of the gods and copulates with himself like the Egyptian Atum. Sarah Rapp, Rapper, from reading Neoplatonism, non-discursive thinking in the texts of Plotinus, Proclus, and Damascius. The centrality of Orphic symbolism in the symposium as a whole. Uh, Sarah Rapper emphasizes the centrality of or Orphic symbolism in the symposium as a whole, arguing that there is good reason to attribute the allegorizing use of Orphic material to Plato himself, and not only to Syrianos, Proclus, Damascius, or Olympiodorus. She says, in this quote from the same text will take us out, The Orphic mystery purports to be an esoteric tradition, one that liberates people from the petrifying conventions of the mass sex gender machine. Its purpose is to recreate the subject, to wrench him away from the public fiction in which he has hitherto been schooled. The Orphic myth promises a return to the undifferentiated state before sexual identity arises, promising to deliver us back inside the egg to become, in the Lacanian sense, hom elets. <laughs> but of course, this is a delusional aspiration, as the myth makes clear, and it is in fact a self-destructive delusion. In my reading of the Orphic cosmology and Plato's symposium, I have emphasized its function as an etiology for human consciousness prior to its regeneration by philosophy. This is the exoteric mind that desperately requires enlightenment, but because of its conditioning, all too rarely seeks it.